Sabbath fast. Saturday, Sabbath, as we would call it Saturday today, the fast day, Sunday, the feast day. How did that get started? I mean, what, what, what's, what's the story behind that? Well, it, it actually grew out of the uh, teachings of the first great Christian heretic, right? Uh, and that was Marcion. And he was excommunicated, what, I think uh, around 144. Hmm. But he viewed the God, the Jewish God, the God of the Old Testament, you see, as this God that, that the Christians should despise and should do whatever they could to show their spite for this God and for this Jewish way. All right. So the idea of taking the Sabbath, which for the Jews was a, you know, was a joyous best day. day, of day the week. Yeah, yeah, the best day of the week. Summit. Take this day and turn it into a gloomy, sad day, mm. right? Mm. Fast on this day. Mm -hmm. Well, although the church threw him out, you know, he, and he founded uh, the, the whole sect of the Marcionites. And, and at that time, this was the major competitor to, to what we would call Orthodox Christianity. This was like a big split. But the Latin Christians, the Christians centered on the leadership in Rome, mm -hmm. took this fasting idea and said, let's hold on to this it. one and, and kept it. That's right. Now, about, what about the, the, uh, the Christians in the East? Well, that was, that was the, the real dividing issue, or one of the real dividing issues. Of course, there was issues of leadership yeah. and so and forth. And there was the nature of Christ and yeah, other things were, that came along. Yeah. And but but the, the So you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't say that the Seventh-day Sabbath was the dividing line between East and West, the well, dividing issue? It became like mm. the big hot potato between these guys because over the next... More than the nature of Christ? Well, over the next uh, roughly thousand time, years, probably. you know, it, it, that, that's what we see coming to the surface again and again. The idea was, was simply this, that the, that the Greek Christians mm -hmm. continued to view the Sabbath as a day of celebration. Even though they would still observe Sunday, right. they still saw the Sabbath as a day of celebration, and they could not, would not fast on that, except for the Sabbath of Easter. All mm -hmm. right. They would not fast on that day. So it, this thing was really sponsored by, by the Latin leadership at, at yeah. Rome. And, it, and you know, it became, you know, it became a way of controlling people, <laughs> you know, keeping Controlling people. the way you behaved on right. that day. Well, imagine you, if, you, if you were observant, Dwight, yeah. and, you were already, and you were already fasting on Wednesday and on Friday, <laughs> and now you add Sabbath. You know, imagine the, the, what that makes Sunday has, into. Yeah. <laughs> well, I just think, imagine you're a kid, and every Saturday That's you can't eat. That's the way I eat. think of it, yeah. You know, you would love Sunday. You would, you would uh, live for Sunday. Yeah. And just, yeah. Now, the name Dragus. Yeah, he, he is uh, a very prominent uh, uh, Greek Orthodox professor, priest mm -hmm. professor. At the, well, at least at the time that we, that we did his interview, mm -hmm. at, the, at their seminary in Boston. Uh, he's he's somewhat of a, uh, I, I think of a, maybe a maverick even even among uh, because Greek he was Orthodox. very open. Yes, I mean, the, yeah. our, our viewers very will open. see this yeah. when they get to part three how open this Greek Orthodox cleric yeah. is yeah. about the importance of the seventh day Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. He's he, he he, very articulate and yeah. and, and uh, uh, strong. I, I think that he's a fairly opinionated guy. Mm. Nothing wrong mm -hmm. with that, of course, Jan. And you know, not, he, no, not he made a plain that that's still the position of the Orthodox Church yeah. today. Yeah. He said they have a Friday evening Vespers to welcome the Sabbath there mm -hmm. at the seminary. Mm -hmm. He said they don't um, observe it. They don't feel like they have to observe it as a Sabbath now because God understands, you mm. know, things are different. Mm. But they still consider it to be the Sabbath. The letter from Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I'll unpack a little bit of that story. <laughs> called also well, the epistle from Jesus, the letter from Jesus. Interesting is that that story was used over and over. You know, By different... Over uh, a period of, what, four or five centuries, the Catholic Church needed a little bit of impetus to their evangelism efforts. And so they would come up with this story about a letter coming down from heaven. Now, now, now in fairness, when you say Catholic Church, you're talking about local priests because the hierarchy disavowed the letter. True or false? False. I don't think there was any, well, well disavowal. Uh, at, at, at different times, there were, there were different reactions to it. The letter uh, apparently came to light, first of all. Uh, Let's just, for the sake of those watching this, this uh, DVD, yeah. what's the content of the letter? 
Well, the content of the letter, it, it first of all purports to be written by the hand of, of Jesus. Okay. Right? All right. So yeah. the letter comes down from yep. heaven and yep. lands on this altar. And, and all it is really is, is a bunch of instructions and threats having to do with the proper observance of Sunday. Of Sunday. Yeah. Uh, so people are slipping there. Mm. So poor sheep, gullible sheep would, when the, when the letter is read up front, say, well, we got our orders. Your people are terrified because they're, first of all, they don't read. There's not much education there. And they're told that if they do things on Sunday that they should work on Sunday, they're mm. going to suffer for it. If they bake bread on Sunday, it's not going to get baked. It'll sit in the oven as dough all day mm. till Sunday's over. If they, um, one story is somebody's cutting bread and blood flows out of it. Mm. Because they baked it on Because they baked it on Sunday. Another mm. guy... So this is all in the letter, giving right. these, 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 these warnings horrible, if you do this. Horrible. If you don't Results. honor Sunday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. This guy goes out in his field and works on Sunday, and his plow gets caught in his leg or his foot, and it stays there the rest of his life. I mean, these things are ridiculous. You think, how they, could they possibly happen? But, mm. you know, they were designed to just terrify people. Now, I'm not going to tell the story that's on part three about the priest from France. Yeah. But I, I want to go back to something you said, Jim. Not all hierarchy react the same way to the letter. Uh, we, we have evidence of the letter being used in Spain. Okay. We have the stories that we tell in, well, in part Ireland, three, which is Ireland and England. England in the 12th century even. Yes. So, so and, and, and there actually are... And it's the same letter. Oh, it's, it's the same. It's very basically, or variations basically on the, the same letter. Okay. But we even find evidence of this letter in Ethiopia. Mm. And we find evidence of this letter being used in the, in the centuries since then, in, uh, up to, to fairly recently, all right? So even though... But there the have, hierarchy, again. E the even, hi even though there have been uh, uh, official statements from the highest levels of, of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, for example, mm -hmm. uh, yet the letter persists. And we find uh, that, that maybe it was, it was um, uh, denied as, uh, as being authentic at one point, and then later on maybe it was used mm -hmm. as, as authentic. Mm -hmm. Not only that, but just in some recent reading that I've done, I have found that even though someone, some pope or archbishop might condemn this letter, in the same, at the same time, well-respected mainline uh, pe people within the, the, the Catholic hierarchy, bishops and, and so forth, were preaching things that are exactly the same as you find written in the letter. Hmm. So obviously this idea of Number one, beginning to bring Sunday, to bringing a, a Sabbath aura to Sunday. To, to Sunday sanctity. Yes, yes. Cer certainly was happening. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea, not only that, of, of bringing this idea of now this is the holy rest day, but also becoming quite legalistic in the way that it was to be observed. Mm. This, this, Dwight, would be the sabbatizing of Sunday. Mm. Right. Turning Sunday into a Sabbath. Let's take another and, and uh, again, I don't want to uh, divulge too much because this is, a, uh, for me, was a fascinating part of uh, part three of Patrick. But let's do a little bit of a correction of history here. Patrick, we when my wife is born, Karen's born on uh, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. All right, <laughs> so he's a saint, he's Irish, and he's Roman Catholic. <laughs> and come to find out, he's not Roman Catholic. He was never sainted, and he's from Scotland. And he's not Irish. <laughs> So there went that holiday. <laughs> yeah, right. And why do, why do we drink and wear green? <laughs> Must be the Irish uh, We connection. know there's the mythical Patrick and the real Patrick. Okay. And you, in your research, found the real Patrick. Right. Fascinating. And, and, and we weren't the first people to, to uncover him, obviously. No. But, it, it, but it, it is true. You know, uh, we should point out that, that if you go to uh, Roman Catholic scholars, they have uh, an alternative story. Mm. You know, uh, about this whole thing. Uh, but there has been so much revision of history. Yeah. That, and we're all uh, guilty of that, and, aren't and, we? Let's, all, let's yeah, be fair. Yeah. We all do a little bit of revisionist thinking yeah. in our own uh, circles and communities of faith. But, but what is quite clear, Dwight, is this. That Patrick was born into a Celtic Christian environment. Mm. All right. And the Celtic Christians... It's quite clear from the documentation that Celtic Christians observed Sabbath. Mm. Okay. They were pretty apostolic in their faith. Yeah. Mm. You know, Rome hadn't influenced them yet. 
to be continued story. on uh, part three. But let's right. talk about the Marian Sabbath, a Seventh-day Sabbath devoted to Mary. Is that it? Right. Now, what's the story behind that? Well, th this goes back actually into the Dark Ages. Uh, and, and there have been people who have been particularly devoted to Mary, uh, mm -hmm. you know, th throughout the Dark Ages and into the Middle Ages and so forth, what, what, or, or rather into Reformation times and beyond. But here's the deal. Uh, to, to make it official, Pope Urban II, this was the pope that, that called for the First Crusade, all right? Okay. At a church council, I believe in 1095, made it official that Sabbaths, and maybe not every single Sabbath in the calendar, but, but many, many of them that were not assigned to other saints, mm -hmm. would be devoted to Mary, all, all right? right. Uh, and th this w was explained on, on several grounds. Number one, uh, that, that Christ himself, before he was born, rested within the womb of Mary, just mm. as God rested from his act of creation. Mm. Uh, the, the, the incarnate Christ rested in the womb of Mary, uh, and, so, and so the Sabbath, the day of rest, is devoted. There's also a belief that, that somehow Jesus appeared to Mary on that Sabbath, mm. on the crucifixion Sabbath. While he's in the tomb. While he's in the tomb. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm, interesting. And, and, and there are other, uh, other rationales uh, involved there, too. What about this Ignatius Loyola connection with the Marian Sabbath? Well, Ignatius Loyola formed the, the Society of Jesus right. during... Became the Jesuits. Yeah, during right. the Spanish Inquisition. Okay. Right? At about the time, or just shortly prior to the time this, that this actually happened, uh, Ignatius was, or I guess we should, should call him Loyola, mm. Loyola was, was called in by the Inquisitors and questioned about his Sabbath keeping. Now the reason why this was so important to the Inquisitors is this. The Spanish Inquisition was targeting Jews who had converted to Christianity and yet maintained some of their Jewish practices, mm -hmm. including, including keeping the Sabbath. Which would prove that they really were still Jews at heart. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, so they wanted to get Ignatius to grill him to find out, are yeah, you... Why are you keeping the Sabbath? This yeah. is what the Jews are doing. So what did so, he say? So he says, he says, I am honoring the Sabbath in honor of Mary. I'm devoted to Mary. And that's uh, the reason. That's the and connection. he said, besides that, I wouldn't do anything Jewish. Up in the country where I live, the part of the country where I live, there are no Jews up there. Hmm. I didn't get this from them. This is my practice of devotion to Mary. Well, it was a well-established Catholic practice today. And by the way, it, it, is still, it is still an established part of Catholic liturgy. There are, th th there are special Prayers to be offered, masses to be said. On Marian Sabbaths. On, on Marian Sabbaths. Mm. Pat, let's talk about, uh, go back to the Nestorians. Uh, we were discussing that in the previous part. But this Nestorian monument, what's up with that? Yeah, that was a, that was a fascinating story. And about the year 1625, these guys were digging. And they, outside the, the uh, walls of the city of Changon, or Sion, mm -hmm. that's where all those terracotta soldiers were found a okay, few years ago. all right, yep. And they hit something, and it turned out to be a monument stone. And the date on it was the year 781. So it had been buried almost a 1,000 years, mm -hmm. 900 years. And the, the top of the monument stone, the characters um, said something to the effect in commemoration of the coming of the people from Tachin or Palestine bringing with them the luminous religion. And the whole stone, you know, has about 1,900 Chinese characters, and it about, had about 50 words in Estrangelo, which is like Aramaic, hmm. with the names of these missionaries. And it described them as people, you know, coming from evidently various parts of the world mm -hmm. and bringing with them this religion. Now, that, you said luminous religion. I mean, wh what's the clue there? They said that this religion lightens darkness with its brilliant precepts. Hmm. And we call it the luminous religion. Would that be Christianity? Christianity. All right. And the Sabbath connection, you know, this is one of those stories that we couldn't include on our DVD. Why? Because we've been so careful to make sure that everything we include is well documented and that okay. anyone can find the same thing we found. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of documentation for a holy day in Christianity in early China. Mm. There is plenty of documentation for Christianity coming to China between the 6th, 8th, ninth century in there. There, you know, there, were, uh, there were old manuscripts found that date back as far as the 8th century. There was a Gospel of John, a Gospel of Matthew. There's a hymn. 
um, to sung to the Trinity. All of these were found, you know, in wow. caves and in old cities. Mm. But there's very little mention of a holy day. But on this monument stone, there's a line that says to the effect, and it's translated either every seven days or every seventh day. Mm. And we're told by, by scholars that either, either is correct. They said that we, uh, we purify ourselves, we purify our hearts, and we meet together and have a sacrifice. And it sounds like it could be referring to a holy day or a religious meeting, but because we've never been able to find anything else that mm. refers to that, we really can't say for sure that's what it is. And, and there yeah. are so you left, that, you left that out of the uh, So we couldn't, we, we with couldn't include Holbrook. it, but it's a fascinating little piece. And, and if, mm. if we were doing a, the broader subject of the church in the wilderness, mm -hmm. just Christianity in general, mm -hmm. you know, we would have a lot to say about Christianity in China in the 8th century. Yeah, because you said, what, 780s? 781. 781. But there have been numerous wow. translations of this thing, yeah, and, and there's just not unanimity among them as to, as to the actual... How to render that. Yeah, ha, ha, exactly how to render it. Mm. Yeah. We have, now, I think I have eight yeah. different translations yeah. of it. Okay, really? Yeah. Yeah. Now, besides China, there's some, and, and the Nestorian Monument, there's some, there have been some other uh, um, pieces of archaeology, uh, historical artifacts that seem to suggest? You know, there's a, there's a graveyard in southern Siberia. It had all these cute little round gravestones, mm -hmm. and the dates on them um, are from 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th century, okay. you know, over a period of several hundred years. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, the inscriptions on them name the people, something about them. They show, you know, they'll name someone and say so-and-so, the wife of the priest, such and such, mm -hmm. so that it showed that this Christianity had a married priesthood, okay. for example. And one of the stones says, you know, so-and-so who died on when, who died on the Sabbath day. Who died so on the Sabbath day. So it's a little, day. it's another a little clue, you know, a little piece. Not that would rock be, hard evidence. Right. That would, it's interesting. And it, another thing that was interesting about it is the names on those gravestones are international. They show that people, they'll say, from such and such a place, they show that they came, you know, from the East mm -hmm. and from the Middle East, both. Wow. So it was sort of an international Christian community, mm. perhaps. Mm. Albigensians, Jim. Albigensians uh, were, unfortunately, the, the target of uh, the first organized inquisition. The first? The first organized mm. inquisition. Uh, refresh, refresh our memories. Where are they from? <coughs> okay, well, southern Geographically. France, you know, southern, southern France. France, southern France yeah. They lived, they had a republican st style of government, uh, representative style of government. They were very successful, productive people. You know, they had farms, gardens, cities. Um, they were also very, um, very tolerant. They were Muslims among them and they were Jews among them. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they lived well with each other. You know, they lived in peace and harmony with each other. But, um, the Pope wanted the King of France to help him get rid of these people. Hmm. And so that's really when the first crusades were organized. And, you know, the, the soldiers... The first crusades were against the Albigensians. Well, there was a crusade. Yeah. It was not the first crusade. It wasn't the, the Middle Eastern crusade. crusade. Went, to, went, right. went to Palestine. Right. But, mm -hmm. See, these people uh, are known historically not only as the Albigensians, they're known as the Cathari. All right? And that, that word actually means, I believe, the pure. Hmm. The term Albigensi really... Refers. It was given to them because they were people who came from the city of so Albi. Yeah. Okay. So what happened is, you know, there were people that held a much more fundamental view of mm -hmm. Christianity and who had the Bible in their own language, you know, dating back to the 11th, 10th, 11th, 12th century up in the mountains, southern Italy, uh, northern France, that area. And they would not accept the authority of... They refused to Are accept... Are they Sabbatarians? There were Sabbatarians among them. Among them. We can't say that they were, you know, they include the Waldenses. In fact, the term Waldensee really was a big term that covered a lot of people. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a broad term and underneath it uh, were, you know, the Catholic Church in order to separate them when they were trying to eliminate them, mm -hmm. sort of uh, renamed them. They would name them after a local leader or the town where they were. So the Albigenses were called after the town of Albi where they lived. There were Henricians who followed a man named Henry and there were mm -hmm. Petributions and there were um, Pasagini. And among those, all, uh, all of those groups, we have references to the Sabbath. Petributions were Sabbath keepers, Henricians, Albigenses. Really? And, um, you know, we just find little bits and pieces mm -hmm. that refer to the fact that they kept the Sabbath, and that was one of the things the church had against them. Mm. Now, the Inquisition somehow gets tied in to the Albigenses, doesn't well, it? 
first of all, th there was a crusade. Now, this was not the crusade not to, to the, the, the to, Holy Land. To the but, but, Middle East. But there was a crusade uh, to southern France, really, yeah. to, to wipe out these people. But what's interesting is that even though there was this crusade and, you know, huge numbers of people were, you know, were killed, it didn't work. The, the, the way that the Albigensians were finally really destroyed, in fact, they virtually disappeared from history in the, in the 14th century, was the, the, um, what we would call the medieval Inquisition, mm. which was simply an, an organization and a, and a formalizing of some things that had already been happening. See, but, but I think it was Pope Innocent who, who uh, in what, I think 1231 or somewhere in the 1200s, anyway, mm -hmm. that date has escaped me, but he, he decides with this church council mm -hmm. that there will be this, this operation, this very, very organized, insidious uh, machine that would grind and grind and grind until there was nothing left to grind. Yeah. And you know, it, it involved people uh, being coerced to... Uh, to report on other people mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. so forth, and mm -hmm. and that. In fact, you show some, you mm. show some uh, pictures in, yeah. in the uh, segment here. We had just a lot make of you cringe and yeah. say, "Oh boy." We had a lot of really graphic old etchings, mm. you know, that we we couldn't show. They're just too horrifying. Too, too. Yeah. You know, yeah. what, the, what people went through, you know. There's a that crusade attacked the city of Béziers in southern France, and mm. there's a famous saying that came out of that. The papal soldiers are going in, and, and they're told to slaughter everyone. And they said to the legate, you know, how are we going to know who's Catholic and who's, you know, heretics here? Mm -hmm. And he said, kill them all. God will know his own. You get up, I think mm -hmm. it's in part three, you get up to uh, the English Isles again. Patrick, we were there, but then you come back to John Wycliffe, the morning star of the Reformation, yeah. a great, uh, you know, a, a, a hero of mine. Well, I was just going to say, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> because somehow you tie him in to, to the uh, Sabbatarian connection. How's that work? Yeah. He, he believed that every person could understand the Bible, mm. you know, and that was a radical concept in a society that believed that only a priesthood could interpret Scripture. But he wanted the Bible be, to be available to every person and said even the plow, plow boy should be able to understand the Scriptures for himself. And that's the, really the, the, the genesis of the English translation, isn't it? Yeah. Sure. Of sure. Holy Scripture. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. 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 What, was, what was new for me when I watched uh, part three is the connection with the Lollards. Of course, I know the Lollards and John Wycliffe. Right. But the connection to the Sabbath. Yeah. Not all Lollards, but to un unpack that just for a moment. Jim. Well, Pat, of course, Jim. they believe the Bible mm -hmm. was the Word of God mm -hmm. and that, uh, that you believe every word that you find in the Bible. And mm -hmm. when they found the Sabbath in the Bible, you know, it struck them. The, the, the documented connection, if we... Mm -hmm. If we can go there, sure. Uh, probably would would go to perhaps the year uh, 1402, 1401, 1402, where there is a, a rather obscure record of a of a trial in in England uh, that involved a man by the name of John Senyo. Now he was he's actually mentioned there in in, in part three, mm -hmm. but his his trial along with the tri with two or three others that were tried with him mm -hmm. uh, involved his observance of the Sabbath. So that is the first little little hint, but there's a, another another line here in in our talking with folks uh, over in England ab about this. Mm -hmm. uh, we we were told that in the in the places, in the in the villages and towns, uh, the valleys, where the Lollards had been strongest, mm -hmm. where where they had really mm -hmm. you know put down their roots, it was in those places, in those very same families from those very same locations. Mm -hmm. That, uh, that the Baptist movement arose. And of course, the Seventh-day Baptist movement eventually arose among, among those Baptists. Interesting. So, so there, is, there, is mm. some, there have been some people who've been, who've been studying that very mm. thing, the, the, the uh, uh, bridge between the Lollards and the people who lived in the same areas uh, two or three centuries later. Wow. <laughs> you had a great lineup of experts. We've already talked about Dragus. Right. Let's right. talk about Leslie Harding. He did some of your seminal research. I mean, the book provided a, some historical, strong historical mm -hmm. foundation for your research. It was actually his doctoral dissertation. Was it his dissertation? Yeah, on, okay. on the, uh, on the, the Celtic Church, church in Britain. Britain. Yeah. It, it's uh, some pretty heavy reading, some of it, but it's very, very thorough, very, very solidly mm -hmm. documented. Mm -hmm. uh, you had an expert, Bartlett. 
Robert Bartlett is an interesting story. He he is a, a professor at the University of St Andrews okay. in Scotland. All right. He's actually married to an American woman, and uh, and he taught I think at the University of Chicago as well. In fact, somebody who who watched that part, part three, mm -hmm. some other expert that I was I was talking to was a, a sort of uh, commenting on our experts, and he, and he pointed out this fellow Bartlett as one of the one of the most highly respected, regarded hmm. uh, of all of our experts. Well, kudos to you to, to for finding him. Well, uh, he, he was a natural choice because of his field of expertise. Hmm. But, but Dwight, there's an interesting story in connection with, with uh, Bartlett. I went to visit him, uh, I guess, two or three months before we actually mm -hmm. went and, and uh, taped his interview. And I was, I was armed with uh, documentation, you know, with quotations, a lot of stuff from, from Pat's earlier research. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sat there in his office, you know, in this old ancient building here in this uh, little wooden office hmm. with books, you know, all around on all the walls and mm -hmm. so forth and, a, and a, a wooden table behind me and here he is at his desk and, and we're having a fairly pleasant visit and I, and I mentioned some point that I had, had read in the, in the notes that I had brought with me and I, I said something about the, the uh, evidence of Sabbath keeping among Protestants in Scotland. He said, oh, that never, never happened. And I said, well, you know, I, I, I have a quotation here, a citation from a, from a book, and I gave him the name of the book. And he said, well, I have that book in my library, I believe. He said, you wait right here. So I sat <laughs> in his office and waited for maybe 10 minutes really? while he went down and, and, uh, and went, through his, went through the library there in, there in that school, and he came back with the book. Well, first of all, I looked at my own, at my own notes, and somehow in communicating them to him, he was looking for the wrong page. And he, found the page that he thought was the right page and he said, no, it's not here. I said, wait a minute, that's not the right page. And I verified what the page was and mm. we turned to, to that page in the book. This was an amazing lesson. This was an old book, Dwight. Old meaning? It was a book that, that may have been published back in the 1800s. Okay. All right. Mm. And, and at, at that time, the binding of books was sort of an inexact operation. And sometimes when books were bound, when the, when the pages were trimmed, uh, some pages would be missed. Some pages were misaligned. And it happened. Uh, not trimmed at the top. Not trimmed at the top. So in other words, uh, that book, that, that page was a closed page. Mm. I mean, you, you've probably had books like that. Books, you take a, right. take a letter opener or a mm -hmm. jackknife and open the page. That's what, that's what happened to that page. At this that man, very page that you were trying to find. That man had never laid <laughs> eyes upon that page in that book. Isn't that something? And neither so, had anyone else. <laughs> neither, that, that, that page had never seen the light of day. All right? uh -huh. and, and it just it was a, a lesson to me that there, is, that there are holes in the research that is done even by the greatest academics. You know? <laughs> and there may be truths that they have missed. Mm. I really think that's the, such an important point. You mm. know, a lot of, through history, the Sabbath has been a non-issue. And so mm. people doing research haven't made note of that particular thing as they mm. go along. Mm. You don't find it. You don't find reference to it often. And, and it may not be because it's not there, but just because it wasn't of any interest to whoever was researching. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. And the other side of that, <laughs> and this is, this is probably even more scary, the other side of that is that in many cases, the evidence is disappearing. You see? Well, stuff is being lost. Yeah. Hmm. Don't know how I can touch that one, yeah. but uh, that's a fascinating thought. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's stuff that's been, been lost. I think, uh, from, the, from my uh, exposure to these five powerful presentations, the drama coming up in part four it has, to, it has to be one of your strongest, uh, was one of the strongest moments for me. Mm -hmm. When we come back, I want to get into part four and the whole Moscow-Russian connection with, with Sabbatarians. Mm -hmm.